In this part of the project, you are trying to come up with a uh, sound generator that combines a signal source with a, an envelope generator. Let me first point out that when you're trying to calculate the appropriate frequency, I think you'll find that the power of two node becomes very valuable. So I just wanted to point out where that is located in case you hadn't used that one before. Well, let's now take a or turn our attention to the idea of producing the raw signal, whether that's a sinusoid or a square wave or what have you. Now the specifications say that we need our sub VI to accept the duration in seconds, the sampling frequency in hertz, and then the desired oscillation frequency also in hertz. I'll just go ahead and establish a default value of one kilohertz for now. That was a control shift click down and drag by the way in order to make the quick copy of the control. And uh, we'll go with concert A 440 hertz and uh, Gee, why don't, we, why don't we just put that up to CD quality sound for now, 44.1 kilohertz. Now duration in seconds can be combined with the sampling frequency to tell us the total number of samples that we actually need. So if you kind of think about the unit or dimensional analysis there, we had seconds being multiplied by samples per second so samples divides or seconds divides out and we're left with samples. So under signal generation, I'm looking for the sine wave generator. And let's let's investigate its terminals here. All right, uh, one of the things we find is that we already have calculated samples. The amplitude, somehow we could establish that as a type of control, I think. Uh, a critical thing to realize about the frequency is that it's actually in normalized units. So the, the frequency is a value that ranges between zero and one. So based on the information that, that we have coming in, if we divide our desired oscillation frequency by the sampling frequency, that gives us our normalized frequency. Well, let's take a look at what waveform is being generated so far. Okay, that's pretty dense because we're generating samples at 44,000 per second. If I decrease my sampling frequency considerably, I can start to see the individual samples showing up a little bit more readily. Now, since our sampling frequency is so low, let me make the oscillation frequency low as well. Okay, pure sinusoid, and it has an amplitude of one. So at this point, we start to look for ways of shaping that with an envelope uh, generator of some sort. Let me point out that under uh, Windows, we have a number of windows available. Here's one that applies an exponential window to the array. And so the, the, the window functions all take a signal shape and uh, or when, and multiply that uh, incoming array by that, that particular window shape. Now there's another 
way to go about applying that idea of um, or applying an envelope signal and that's um, creating the envelope yourself first and then multiplying that by the constant amplitude sinusoid. So what I'll do is see if I can first build up the envelope itself and then I'll go ahead and multiply that. So let me just look at what we've got so far. Well, that doesn't seem very exponential, does it? Actually, I didn't want to use a ramp here. What I wanted instead was a constant, or an array of constants, which could then be multiplied by the exponential window. We don't seem to have something that looks like a constant inside our signal generation palette, but if we look back at our array palette, We can uh, initialize array, an array based on the total number of samples that are required and give it a constant value of one. Okay, that, that makes sense. So kind of using this as a, a general idea of first creating the envelope and then applying that to the signal source we apply the envelope by the multiplication process. Well, that looks good. So here's some general notions for you about how you might go about creating an oscillator and then shaping that by your envelope generator. Let's try some alternative values for our sampling frequency and our oscillation frequency. So this would be something that you can actually hear. Again, 440 hertz is the same thing as concert A. That's the uh, frequency that orchestras tune up to. What I also wanted to mention here is if we switch the waveform graph to logarithmic display, if you were to hold the straight up edge up to that, you would see that it's falling off at a linear rate. So the exponential amplitude decay actually gives the impression to our ear of a constant uh, reduction of intensity with time. So our, our ear responds to intensity, not, not the amplitude. Now one thing you're trying to do is use the enumerated data type to establish a number of different instruments, each having different signal source types and, and possibly different envelope shapes. And what I'm doing now is just putting in some uh, demonstration names for three types of signal oscillators and uh, one percussion instrument. So once I define those uh, specific values for the enumerated data type control, when I wire that to my case structure, uh, we initially only see the two options showing up, but we can always say add a case for every value, and now we've got a case structure set up such that we could place each one of our different instruments inside and that way we can pick the instrument we want simply by adjusting that enumerated data type control. So for example, if we were wanting to swap out sine with something else, we've got a triangle wave, square wave, sawtooth wave, and uh, we've even got some noise sources down in that palette as well. Yeah, again, there's the some of the noise source sources showing up below. All right, so that gives you some ideas about how to proceed with the, the notion of creating different instrument types. So the last thing we need to consider is how you actually go about 
producing an array of signals where we've got a whole series of notes one after the other. What I'm doing here is um, converting my duration control into an array style control. And I'm also doing the same thing for my oscillation frequency. So the intent here is that I could have a series of values where I specify different durations and different frequencies. By the way, if I wanted to do a little interval of silence, you can simply type in a value of zero for the frequency. So here I've got a, a moderate length note of one second, half that length at 0.5, and then a long note at three seconds. So my calculation for a number of samples and the normalized frequency is exactly the same, except now I can use my array type control uh, instead of my scalar type control. I'll try to get these in the same order that I had earlier. We'll need to do a little bit of different thing on the output side. So I'm going to wrap all of that inside a for loop. And uh, the really cool thing about for loops in LabVIEW is that it, when you wire an array to the input, and if you have indexing enabled, so that's what it's calling the auto index tunnel right now, then the loop uh, automatically uh, cycles over however many elements you have in that array. So it's not necessary for you to somehow calculate the array size and wire that up to the value of n. So at this point, we're actually looping uh, over the three different notes that we've specified on the input. Now each pass through the loop will generate one note and uh, what I'm doing is just kind of rearranging things here a little bit uh, to make some room for the mechanism that we'll be using for concatenating our signals together. Now, if I simply do a direct connection and use the default of auto indexing, you'll notice that the one dimensional array gets promoted to a two dimensional array on the output side. So what it's doing is it's collecting um, the notes together and stacking them into a new two-dimensional array. And we can actually see that in the waveform graph because each note is being plotted as a different color. So instead, what we really want is to have all of the notes um, concatenated one after the other. But if we if all we do is disable the indexing, we only get the very last note. Uh, this one that we're seeing here is actually the three second note and that's it. Now if I change the tunnel to the shift register format, well some somehow I need a place for that to go. But the, the notion of shift register is it preserves the value from the, you know, from each loop iteration and it makes that available on the next loop iteration. So what I'm going to do now is use the uh, build array node, but specifically set up with the concatenate inputs option established. And you need to make sure you do this first before you attach your arrays. So what I want to do is take on each pass of the loop, 
we'll take the single note that we calculate and append that, append that by concatenation to whatever we had computed on the previous pass through the loop. Hey, that looks pretty good. We can see our medium, our short duration note, and our long duration note there. Now you notice a curious thing here. Every time I run the sub VI, it actually starts over with whatever you had finished up with on the last pass. So it keeps concatenating every single time, which potentially is an interesting effect. But if you wanted to have the ability to just generate one song each time you run it, we need to initialize that shift register with a um, constant array. All right, what I'm now doing is disconnecting my uh, shift register. And I'll do this using a little bit different technique. What I'll do is simply connect a wire path from the output background to the input, and it automatically establishes the feedback node. And so this is essentially the same concept as the shift register technique. It's just a little bit different way of um, indicating it on the uh, block diagram. So the initializer terminal on the feedback node works in exactly the same way as it did for the shift register. I have to a little bit be careful on the connection style here. We need to disable indexing on the loop tunnel so that way the one dimensional array that we're building inside the loop is what we have at the end. Looks good.